Hello and welcome to A Trip to the Movies, where each week a special guest takes us on their perfect night out at the cinema. This week we are joined by an incredible actor who made his big screen debut in Stardust before going on to appear in the hugely successful Chronicles of Narnia series, as well as televisual behemoths like Westworld and Shadow and Bone. He'll soon be seen in the new series of Black Mirror out this Thursday. It's about to get hot in here, and not just because my guest is in LA and it's currently even hotter in the UK, but because it's the super supremely talented ben barnes ben how are you i'm well mate thank you so much for having me oh it's absolutely lovely to have you on uh how is chilly la it's, yeah it's a bit great it's a bit gray and gloomy <laughs> but it's yeah it makes uh it makes a nice nice change to have shipped to have swapped i think i have to come back now yeah i think that's the rules this oh, isn't what i signed up for this is the whole point <laughs> This is this is unacceptable. This cloud cover, yeah. Have except a word. that Have when a it word is sunny in LA, <laughs> <laughs> when it is sunny in LA, though, it works. This this city currently roads are melting and everything is broken oh, because no. it's a little bit hotter than usual. I do know the. Uh, I, I remember the feeling. Well, I was kind of liked it. I was liked when London feels like. I was like when London feels like a bit sticky. Hmm. Yeah. Do you really? Yeah. I I kind of I can't I can't fathom why that might be. I'm currently very <laughs> sticky and it's 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 relatively unpleasant. Oh, I'm sorry. So I've watched you. We were just discussing before we started. I've watched you being brilliant on screen from afar, <laughs> but I've never got to interview. This is our first ever I know, interview. I can't, I can't quite fathom it. When I saw the email, I was like, "Hey, no, great. That's so fun." No, this is brilliant. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it, man. So, um, oh, do you want a weird story? Yes, please. We'll, we'll cut this if it's a little bit too creepy. But I swear I once walked past you in a hotel in the Mediterranean. And <gasps> I was I literally... Oh, yes, you absolutely did. You absolutely did. And I nearly... <laughs> really? And I nearly... And I was, I was with my, um, my, my, my... I took my parents there and I nearly... Ran back and went, Malik Zane. <laughs> I, I okay, think good, full naming I... someone on holiday when they, you know, for no reason at all is it, other than to go hello. It just felt, um, it felt a bit, um, I don't know, a bit crass or something. I was like, no, leave him alone. I, I... I like the fact that both of us had exactly the same very British reaction. I was like, oh, my God, I should say hello. And then I was like, no, wait, no, you don't. You don't know him. It <laughs> yeah, would be, you don't it would know be him. weird. Well, I think we're conditioned, <laughs> aren't we, to look at these kind of like, um, you know, you look at like celeb parties and people and you're like, oh, look, uh, Tom Holland just met Jessica Chastain. <laughs> uh, and then and then and then. But then if you want to say hello to somebody like, oh, yeah, but that's not me. I'm British. I can't. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not allowed to have that moment. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and full disclosure as well. Uh, I was very sunburnt. I'm very vain, and you look very cool. And I was like, this this is not the right moment. <laughs> I, I can't. I'm going to wait. But yeah, that was a, a well, yeah, very was, a very was strange my moment. And dad, I think that was you know there's balance <laughs> points there. Um. So, talking of talking of cool. Um. Black Mirror, that's pretty cool. That's great. I mean, Charlie Brooker is like a god level writer. He really uh, is. I mean, you 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 get a script from him. Is it is it different to read in a regular script? Was it exciting? So I had to say, I got he. I actually just got an email from Charlie Brooker, who I again, who I who I've never met, and uh, it just said um, we're shooting this tiny part of this episode. It has to be you. Um, come and do it, basically. And I was like, Black Mirror, absolutely, yes. I don't care what it is. If I have to chop off my own thumbs, I'll I'll be there. Um, and uh, turns out it's playing this guy up to chop off his own thumbs. No, no, it's not. It was it was <laughs> it was, stupid. It was um, uh, it, yeah. So it was just this this little contribution to it. And they were very much like, look, we know it's only a small thing, but like, uh, you know, we we. Yeah, uh, it, We'd love you to come do it, and and uh, and so I said yes, and then they sent the script, which I think was so fantastic. And I'm a huge Black Mirror fan, obviously seen every episode more than once. Um, mm -hmm. Always sort of um, 
sort of coveted, uh, you know, being involved. And uh, um, th this particular episode I thought was particularly good, though, right up my street in terms of the genre of it. And um, I, I actually like the Black Mirrors that are a little bit less, um, that's, uh, that's sort of just psychological fuckery. But uh, can I say that? I don't know. Um, rather yeah, than rather than really dark, um, rather than sort of horrible, dark, nasty things that you'd sort of rather go through your day without thinking about. Um, and this one has that more of that tone. And I'm in it for. Uh, I mean, I have a you know what we would call in the trade a. Uh, I've got a cough and a spit in it. Um, is but, that, is um, that, I've never heard that term. I've never heard that term. Is that, a, be, is that a trait I think term? it might be. Also, I think that might be because I might have heard it from, from quite an old actor quite a long time ago <laughs> who might have heard it from another, and then nobody has passed it down because... Um, but um, no small actors. Wow. Small, I like that. I'm going to... I think... No small parts, only small actors. That's the way around it is. Yes, but yeah, anyway, that makes as, more sense. As seen but... from my from the sort of promo material, which makes it seem like I'm in it uh, more than five seconds. Um, my scene is with uh, Salma Hayek, who is uh, a goddess among humans. So that's pretty excellent. Yeah. Wow, I, I did I did take a look at the cast, and it is um it is the most star studded episode of Black Mirror yet. You've got yourself, Annie Murphy, Salma Hayek, Michael Sarah, Himish Patel, Rob Delaney. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a big old list. Yeah, it's a really fun. It's really fun as well. I, 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 I presume, I, I think I signed about 62 NDAs, so I, I think, but I think I'm safe. It's a fun, it's fun and good. <laughs> I think that's a probably, those, are, those, I think those are on the list of acceptable descriptions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, still, I mean, it, it, honestly, getting an email that goes, it has to be you from Charlie. I mean, that's 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 a, that's an amazing audition. That's, it really was. Like it really strength. was. It was there's, they're very specific. The casting had to be very specific in this episode for um, But it was. Yeah, it was a very nice little email to receive. But you are no stranger to big shows. Ben Barnes, Westworld, The Punisher, Shadow and Bone. <laughs> So this is here's my little uh, to Penneth. Like you really, because I've watched all those shows, and I think you have this amazing gift of exploring reprehensible <laughs> characters, but making us the viewer so invested in their fate in in a, a, a much more empathetic, if not sympathetic, way mm. than perhaps we would normally do if you hadn't played them you really do bring something to these characters thank you i i i that's really um kind of you i i um i think i'm just really interested in and i i i, I sort of probably have talked about this b before in a way that anyone who is listening to this because they uh are a supporter of mine will, will find very tedious but um uh i'm just interested in I'm interested in the duality of people and the sort of the gray areas of existence and the fact that we all have the capacity to be everything and feel everything. And there is, there is, there is nobody who is this a sort of caricature of three adjectives, like people are described at the beginning of scripts. And there are reasons that people act out in life and um, everybody has history and everybody has these, you know, everybody has these traits, which are, uh, you know, everybody has flaws. Um, and I think even if you're looking at a character that's reprehensible, it's, you, you, you know, I think it's your duty to look for the characteristics in that person that are opposite to that. Um, and I think sometimes they can even enhance it. You know, I, I think if the character is scary, I want to see the sort of soft underbelly because... Mm -hmm. Because then it's all—it's almost it, you humanize it, and then it's almost even scarier that they're behaving in a way that you can't understand. Um, so I think it's a—it's a fine line between sort of you know making sure that villains seem like villains because you don't want to be um, sort of supporting them, but at the same time, I'm interested in—I'm interested in people and uh, mm. and and what we can all be and. I remember seeing an interview with an actor once that said, you know, he can scream and shout and throw a chair, but sitting opposite someone saying, I love you felt really um, foreign and difficult to him. And I was like, well, that's interesting because I feel the exact opposite. I feel like maybe no one's going to take me seriously if I scream and shout and swear and throw a chair. 
but then you get cast as a you know a psychopathic ex-marine in something and you're like well i have to find my my version of fury i have to find what that mm -hmm. looks like on me because i know it's in there full felt furious so i i'm just i think it's just because i'm interested in it you know it's like when you're at school and you're like you're going to do well at the subjects you're interested in mm. so i end yeah, up yeah i end up uh, uh playing um you know uh, psychopaths who still want to, to love someone <laughs> so is so wait 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 i mean that is a lovely way of explaining it and i totally understand is it that is it that then you are like you you sort of reached a point where you were like this is going to be a challenge for me and then you've continued exploring that challenge or has it got to a point where people are like uh you know like to, uh, to mimic the charlie brooker email like we want ben to do this because he can take an inverted commas villains and create a much more fleshed out deeper character i think it started that i i was playing um sort of the, these sort of uh, protagonists the sort of boy with sword boy with gun boy with stick big stick mm. um <laughs> hit hit dragon on head you know rescued <laughs> rescue damsel which is sort of not the way of things anymore anyway but um uh i think it was a bit of a subversion for me to to kind of take that natural um sort of i i suppose sensitivity or vulnerability or whatever it was that i because I never thought I'd be playing, you know, um, kind of, uh, you know, commanding, you know, military people or or, or um, those kind of those kinds of characters. I thought I would be sort of flopping about doing doing sort of British uh, Pugh Granty mumbly things that like I'm stumbling with now, <laughs> and um, and. Uh, and so I think they thought, oh, well, well, we'll get that part for for free, as it were, with 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 him. So it's interesting to, so wouldn't it be interesting to see the other side? But then it it sort of turned into this thing of like, oh, I have this sort of slight niche of, you know, dark or manipulative certainly characters that you that you don't not want to hug. Um, and uh but i think I but i think I, 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 but i think it's time to put them to bed honestly like I, I like i really am kind of overplaying particularly it's the untrustworthy it's the it's the untrustworthiness of it because i think you do leave a little drops of legacy um even if that word feels sort of disgusting but you sort of leave little drops of breadcrumbs of who you are behind in these parts and people i think find it difficult not to associate those with with who you are and i think that one of you know it's really important in me in life that people um understand that I'm, I'm a sort of good honest man i think as you get older for some reason that i i don't know but it just becomes uh higher on your priority list that people see you that way and i think the more you sit in these characters for sort of five six years in a row now to four or five different characters i've played who are you know, essentially become sort of liars or whatever. You're like, oh, I just, I think it's just time for me to play someone you're rooting for. That's that's fascinating. So you're not talking about typecasting here. What you're talking about is a, a kind of osmotic effect of like aspects of these roles, like overflowing into reality, uh, and people basically going, oh, Benzer, he might not be, uh, he might not be a good one because he created the fold, for example. Well, I, yeah, I don't think it's is it's as sort of straightforward as that, but I think there is something that sort of seeps into the consciousness about your, they just associate you with that kind of stuff. And then and then you do, like you say, you do just get offered more and more, uh, you know, murdery roles that are just really <laughs> disgusting. I got offered a role uh, recently that was, you know, this, there was a character that was cutting out children's tongues. And I was just like, I actually feel very strongly about not being associated <laughs> with putting this out into the world, even if it's excellent. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's really important to me to not be the 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 the, the, the kid tongue cutty guy. Do you know what I mean? In life, I want to be the guy that you're going kiss her, kiss her, kiss her. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure, sure. I, I I have to admit. Even with your uh, no small amount of talent, 
a child tongue cutting villain would be hard to make an audience root for even slightly. Uh, that, that would be a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I should reconsider. Oh, wait, Maybe look, I should reconsider. I knew because it. Challenge, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I like it. I love a challenge. All those 80s quest movies that I just grew up on that are just like, you know, got, I'm, built, I'm built for challenge. <laughs> <laughs> see i shouldn't have said it we're gonna sit ne next up here it comes child tongue cutting um now let's go back to um uh, this is a spoiler for shadow and bone and i figure because of how uh, uh passionate the fans of that show are anyone who is going to care is already seen dead it, but gone. dead gone entire corners of the internet dedicated to the shock of people who clearly didn't read the books but have read uh, be watching the series who are like this cannot be Dead, this stabbed, will not body stand burned. we saw it happen so are you happy to say goodbye and i mean that in the sense of do you feel like you've completed an arc of a journey for that character you clearly knew it was going to happen or is it kind of sad to say goodbye to a character that you have spent X amount of hours on screen developing yeah. and countless more off screen building uh, an identity for an audience? So I will say that it's two it's twofold as a as a sort of reaction, which is I had read these the book, so I, there was a familiarity with the arc of the character. I didn't know how many seasons it would kind of be spread out over. Um, and, you know, I really did champion this character, and I, particularly in the early parts of the, in the first season of, of, of Shadow and Bone, um, you know, where you're un, undecided about this man's motivations potentially. Um, and even when those become clear, you're looking for those sort of shreds of, humanity and 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 potential for um you know potential for sort of uh forgiveness and um i think i was sort of championing him and then in the second season he's a little bit more uh ruthless and he really is kind of extremely toxic and and i think it was important for me to then champion that and make sure that he was that um, you know, even if I can't find the, the, the sort of, um, little moments of tenderness sort of towards the end, which I think were in the book and, and became important to me. So I really was the sort of champion for, for the, for the character as, as you sort of have to be when you're, um, uh, w w when, when you're sort of, um, g well, gifted the opportunity to, 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 to curate them and look after them. Um, so I, so I didn't know it and I felt very close to it, but I also wanted it to be the story that was in the books, the one that I knew, because it, it, when you read something and you know, it's based on something, it sort of feels, um, it feels like canon, you know, so you have to, you, mm. you really want to, uh, be faithful to it. Um, uh, having said that, that this, the, the sort of young cast of it, are just so, ex I mean, they're fabulous in the show and they're really they're so well cast in, in, in their characters and they all take, they're all so passionate and brilliant, uh, but they're all just like such lovely human beings that I love being around them. Um, we, we joke, it's a little bit like that, uh, Steve Buscemi, uh, meme or gif. See, this is already, I'm showing why, cause I can't remember which one's <laughs> what meme is the one with the writing. Yeah. The meme, or maybe it does move anyway. It's the one with Steve Buscemi, he's got a backwards hat and a skateboard. He's got a backwards hat and a skateboard and it says, um, hello, fellow kids. Um, uh, 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 and, yeah. and, and it sort of feels a bit that way since I'm, I've got 20 years on some of them. But um, uh, they did, they did <laughs> the risk of sounding absolutely upside down. They, they made me feel like, really made me feel part of it and sort of like, really like vivacious and, and kind of young, uh, being out there in Budapest shooting. And, uh, you know, I felt we had this little tribe, this little sort of, um, tribe vibe, hashtag tribe vibe. Mm -hmm. Um, God, that feels, that feels that I'm going to get stick from them for saying that, uh, <laughs> but they do, they teach you things and they, and, and, 
and um, they come to you for things, which feels amazing because you have been there before. Because I did walk onto fantasy sets over 15 years ago and have these experiences, and I know what it, how it plays out in in a lot of ways. I know what's uncomfortable about it. I know what the rewards are. Um, so it felt good to kind of be in that role. So I, I will rip, I will miss the process. I think. Um, massively um if they make more of it um without me for sure i will feel i will feel left out but i think over the last sort of 20 years you get used to saying goodbye to things uh mm. saying goodbye to punisher saying goodbye to westworld saying goodbye to these things that you invest y y you know your whole life in you but you know what do you do for a living i'm on a show called westworld what 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 is your life about? It's about playing this character called Logan. It's about playing this character <laughs> called Billy Russo. It becomes so much of what your it becomes so much of what your life is about. Um, even if you're trying to, to maintain a sense of self and the other things you enjoy and the people you're around, even if you try to maintain that, it 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 it, it seeps into it into every part of what you're doing um because it it's it's a very difficult job to do that without letting it become your identity uh mm. and so uh, yeah i will always miss the jobs that i leave behind but somehow we're so adaptable as, as as human beings and i think actors in particular so much rejection and moving on that you make the next job if you, if it, usually you try and make the next job you're going to do feel like the most exciting, the one that you want to be doing, because otherwise you'd be miserable. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. And I did also watch you um, age almost as quickly as the villain from the end of the last crusade. Then when you didn't know what a meme or a gift was, I was like, <laughs> he's just getting older in front of my eyes. No, that's it's like the end of the fine. end of Dorian I, I, Gray, where I go from twenty five to ninety in about 30, <laughs> in about thirty seconds. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so, listen, um, I, I want to get to our cinema, but uh, very quickly, um, I was reading about this. Is looking much further ahead, so I don't know how much you can say or how much is really out there. But uh, you're in a a, a, a Patrick Marber written a uh, yeah. film called the critic that's coming out either later this year no one knows yet it's still all up in the ether but that sounds exciting yeah, well the, yeah the, and the big draw for me was that it stars C and mckellen who is you know i've had the privilege of working with so many of my heroes but he really was one that uh it was just imp i'd said yes before i even Red got to the title because I saw he was doing it, and um, he was just as magical as you would hope and expect. Um, isn't he? Isn't he? He's just he really fundamentally is. one of the nicest people I've I've ever had the pleasure to to interview. Nice Present company and, and interesting and and thoughtful, but also just a little bit magic. I don't, you know, just a mm. little bit, and not just because Gandalf. You know, I think. Well. It does go. It goes back to what you were saying, though. Maybe it seeped in. Well, it well, does. Like I think McKellen it is... can't not all these, all those. We associate with all these extraordinary things, but he does just seem a little mm. bit extraordinary as well. And um, mm. yeah, very, very feel very lucky to be able to have um, done a few little scenes with him. Um, and Mark Strong and Gemma Arterton, also people that I've wanted to work with for a long time. And it's uh, a brilliant story. And Patrick is obviously such a, a prolific um writer and so so thoughtful and you know can make anything feel like the most interesting thing in the world um and so yeah i'm excited for people to 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 see that i have no idea you know how it turned out or or, or when it's out or anything like that but it was uh yeah it was nice to come back and do something that felt really british as well um it, 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 it does very feel sad. very 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 british but it's 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 going to be great to see you back on the big screen and talking of the big screen ben i'm very excited for this you're about to enter another dimension where our uh -oh. virtual cinema awaits for your perfect night at the pictures you are our guide we are your audience let's go on a trip to the movies so we push open the doors <laughs> to our temple of film and find ourselves in the foyer 
There's an excited buzz as there always is in a cinema foyer. The hum of anticipation. It's your perfect cinema trip, Ben. Who have you picked, living or dead, to go with you? Oh, wow. Um, who have I picked, living or dead, to go with me? Your perfect cinema companion. Uh, my perfect cinema companion. Um, mm. I tell you, it's not. It's not um, anyone who demands sort of cinema conditions because I am a bit of a, I am a bit of a, I want a, a sort of collusive experience. I want to be able to whisper and I want to be able to have oh. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, it's not, okay. a it's not a trait that I'm proud of. Um, it's not a trait that I'm proud of. And I, it's definitely got me in trouble before, uh, sort of serious movies, but I want to be able to enjoy the experience. If I'm going to go out and have the experience, if I, if I want deathly quiet, I can watch it at home. Um, so you're, and you're okay with other people whispering? No, then? So no, you, you, you don't no, mind? No, it. absolutely not. No, <laughs> I, complete silence. Um, but except from me. <laughs> I actually went to cinema so by myself. You... I actually went to the cinema by myself for the first time last week, ever. How was the experience with no one to whisper I felt to? A bit, a bit lonely because I didn't have anyone to whisper to. <laughs> I didn't have anyone to enjoy, yeah. enjoy it with. I... So, yeah. So not not by myself. I think is my answer. Um, okay, not by yourself. So with with someone, do you do you have a uh, have you had a cinema buddy in the past? Is there someone who you've worked with, who you've been to the cinema with on downtime, who you're like that was an amazing cinema experience? Well, or usually the people the people that I've worked with, we've usually been watching the premieres of the films that we've done, which is a <laughs> cringeful experience <laughs> in <laughs> in almost every fathomable way. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, I, I, I did not see this question in advance, so I don't have a thoughtful, <laughs> interesting answer for you. Um, That's absolutely fine. You can go to the cinema, not on your own, but with who, how about we just put you next to a person who enjoys being whispered to, or does that sound weird? Yeah, it sounds kinky and I don't hate it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that it's for someone who's excited to see the thing that you're going to see. Um... Okay, this is fine. We'll just, what we'll do, we'll invite a special member of the public who is excited to be whispered oh, to. Oh, no, I, no, absolutely and... not. I'm not a member of the public, no. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I would say, I would say, I will, I will, I will say that I have had through my life um, really hmm. good experiences going to cinema as as dates in okay, general great. so i would say i would like to go with a date because i think it gives you something to talk about afterwards tell you a lot about someone whether they're a whisperer or not uh, and um I, I, and generally through my through my through my life so i would say i will go with a i will go with a date that doesn't mind being whispered all right that's fantastic. This is this is that's actually a really exciting answer. Great, I'm great, really pleased I was we got there. there that I was like, I know you sent some questions in advance, and I looked at them and thought I was being really, really uh, considerate, and then I'm like, yeah, I've, I've absolutely bombed on the first one. So I'm really hoping. <laughs> I'm really fine. hoping I didn't answer someone else's set of questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've seen I've seen some of your <laughs> answers, um, but. Um, I will make that into the most epic first answer you've ever heard. Great. Old, old scissor old hands. Oh, I'm editing. good at that. Uh, so, you're going with the date. Now there is a clock on the wall in the foyer. It reads a specific time. What time of day have we gone to the cinema? Oh, I'm a big fan. I'm actually a very big fan of a late night cinema. Um, mm. I'm a, I'm a big fan of a sort of uh, like a 10 p.m. screening. Okay, that's interesting. So dinner first, then a movie. Yeah, 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 I think so. But don't eat too much dinner so you've got room for treats. But um, no pudding at dinner. But because um, but, I'm still going to have treats even if I'm full. 
But um, <laughs> but yeah, because then you kind of come out into the sort of like slightly empty world as well, which I like that because I, I think it kind of continues the sort of dream experience of being uh, in a film as well. Sometimes when there's few when there's fewer people around to um, to, to, to to kind of um, Interrupt poise, the thought process. Your I know post, your post post cinema bliss or 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 kind of fury, depending on how good the film was. It that's that's interesting because I always used to be a look. I'm going to go in the day because the cinema's quiet. It's great. There's not as many people there. But as I've come round, as I've got older, I'm very much in your camp. Mm. I think that it's it's the worst experience in the world to go and see a movie and then suddenly have to go and do something like, because you lose, you, you lose immediately lose. You just, but I also don't mm. want to go at seven thirty at night. And also when are those people having dinner? But I don't want to go at 7.30 night. It's always like full of, <laughs> full of, uh, yeah, a, a, a really crowded cinema for the uh, foyer is not, is not, not the vibe. Okay. 10 PM. I think that's a great time. I think it's a, it's you, a great you time. You wait pick, as long so you... for popcorn. <laughs> that's true. Cues are shorter. That's that's absolutely true. Well, before we get on to the snacks, you booked the tickets for this trip. Thank you very much. You're Where are we sitting in the auditorium? What seats have you booked for us? Um, h- halfway back in the middle. Classic answer. And it is the most popular answer. I I I. I sit on the aisle because I like to be able to go to the bathroom. I don't have the strongest bladder. Yeah, so, um, I, I'm so that's that's uh, so ideally there's enough people in there to have a, a communal experience, but not too many that you feel claustrophobic. And in this perfect version of my life, which you're um, curating for me, I'm sitting front middle, so the sound is the best, the surround sound. Um, and I don't have to crane my neck, but there's there's someone sitting on my right that I can whisper to. But all ten seats to my left are empty, so I can just <laughs> dip out if I need to. That's oh, I mean, this is fantasy. I like you, this. you are presenting me no. with fantasy scenarios, so I'm going to give you fantasy answers. This is wonderful. No one's ever taken it to this degree before, but you're absolutely right. This is your perfect cinema trip. You can have. Yep. The middle, uh, and did you want the middle at the uh, at the centre or the front at the centre? Where are we talking here? Did you say the front? No, the middle, the middle. middle, yeah. The middle, the middle. Okay, and you are having an entirely empty row. I don't know why I've never thought of that, but yes, yeah. Ben, that is dumb. That's yours. It's wonderful. Okay, so before well, we leave, also, the presumably, foyer, one presumably more we're in one of those cinemas where the seats recline all the way back to to, to, to almost a bed. Um, <laughs> and 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 the sort of footstool has some kind of you know cozy but blanket in it it's presumably it's one of those uh very bougie cinemas so getting up from those you know you don't want people next to you you might need to you know. yeah 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 exactly yeah your you, you, your muscles may have atrophied and you'll have to sort of roll it's essentially the, the end of you... wally for me at, but <laughs> you, you know in the cinema <laughs> I'm just a blob. Okay. <laughs> right then, the final thing we need before we leave the or uh, the foyer and enter the auditorium, what are you choosing to eat? All manner of foodstuffs are available at the various counters. Oh, the smells are amazing. What are you choosing to eat? Um I think I'm I'm going with um a, a medium-sized popcorn because a small is unshareable and a large it just makes me feel guilty that I didn't finish it. Um, and then I'm going to buy some M&Ms and I'm going to throw them in the popcorn. Oh, I've heard about this. Yeah. This, I tried this is it an once, incredible tried thing. it once, thought it sounded sacrilegious, but it's, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it is fantastic. And... Um, and um, I'm, a, I'm a Diet Coke. So, I'm a Diet Coke so, man. Okay, I like this. So uh, we're saying no to hot dogs, nachos, burgers, pizza, all of these. Warm foods in cinema. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So you're having a, you're having a medium popcorn. Now, did I hear right that you said if you get a large popcorn, 
you feel guilty about not finishing it because I'd argue popcorn is one of the few foodstuffs on the planet. It is impossible not to finish what is in front of you. Yes, it, 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 sometimes, but I think large. Okay, are we talking pre nineteen ninety seven? Because I think large meant something different. <laughs> I think large are you... in a cinema is just it, it's a trough. <laughs> isn't it? It's just yeah. like you need two arms to hold it. So I, uh, nobody's... Uh, yeah. And it makes me sad when people have sort of like left them, the buckets on the floor and kicked them over and there's popcorn everywhere. And, and I know that you're not supposed to feel like of any way about that, but I do. So... Mm. I mean... It, <laughs> Clear yes. up your cinema. I, I, Clear I, I, up I, your I, cinema trash, all right? Just do it. Yeah. That's it. What a... What a... Clear up your cinema. I'm gonna. That's a good slow. Clear up your cinema trash. Now, yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think as films have got longer, popcorn buckets have got bigger, and I think that's yeah. that's that's the connection there. That's the correlation. Right then, we've got your medium popcorn. That was salted popcorn. Am I, am I right? Because the, the M and M's are the sweetness. Yeah, I do. I do love. I do love that sort of kettle corn mixed corn. But but in this instance, yeah, it's 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 lightly salted. Slightly salted. All right, we've got everything we need now to leave the foyer. So we push open the doors to the corridor down towards the auditorium. Now, it's looking a little bare right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up posters along the cinema wall that illustrate some of your most important movie memories. And the first poster we're putting up depicts your fondest movie memory. My fondest movie memory. Um, I have two that spring to mind. Um, the first one... I, I came to America when I was about 10 for the first time. And it was the week that the Lion King came out. Um, and the, the cinema going experience in America, I've noticed it, it is different to, to going in England. It's very vocal. Mm. There's, there's, there's more um, applauding mid movie. There's more gasping. There's more, you know, sometimes commentary um at the screen um involving yourself in the dialogue uh uh so and but this obviously the lion king was like this extraordinary film and i was 10 so everything was brilliant and um i just remember there being this sort of whooping and screaming and gasping at, uh, you, you know at mufasa's fall and and I just, it was so involving, it felt sort of 4, 4D, you know. Um, <laughs> so that was quite a magic one. Um, I was, I'm, I'm just going to come, I'm going to be, I'm going to just, I want to be really honest with you. Is it good? Because I've never seen The Lion King. <sighs> I've, I've heard it's quite good. You've never seen Are we okay? The Lion King. So I I just I have a, a massive gap in my movie CV and it's it's Disney animation sort of pre Pixar. I just I, I never I never really saw it. So I can tell wow. by the, the your face that you're. But you're, what about this what about is... I mean I mean I presume we're similarish in age. What about Robin Hood or The Sword in the Stone or Aladdin or Hercules or any of these? Please tell me you've Weirdly, seen at least I, one I, of those. Wow! I remember being. I I'm remember, glad no, I didn't I talk remember to you on very... holiday now. <laughs> <laughs> what would we have even talked about? I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I guess I, I. I don't want to make this even weirder than me not having seen them, but I. I. I do remember. Actually, do you know what I remember seeing? <laughs> I remember seeing very young. Disney's Robin Hood and and finding Maid Marian. The the fox quite attractive. Yeah, no, she's a fox, and she's so... a literal a literal okay. fox. Okay, so that's not too weird. No, no, I think no, maybe no. I she's thought... a, she's, oh, she's, oh she's the sexual awakening of many a young boy. I would say. Oh, oh brilliant! Terrible. Her, her and the Cadbury's caramel bunny. Uh, uh, were, were yeah, well, that one's me. that's sick. <laughs> okay, so the Lion King, right? What's this, what's the next one? Let's get away from this quagmire. Okay, well, the other one, the other one was one of my first ever dates, which I I didn't really think through very well in terms of like 
what the effect of it might be. But one of my first ever dates, I, I went to see Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, which obviously setting the bar incredibly high with Leonardo DiCaprio being incredibly beautiful and romantic. But um, it was just, yeah, it was just wonderful. Um, I just, I felt, I remember feeling mesmerized by it and, and, and completely in love with, as a, as a, you know, young teenager, completely obviously in love by the end, both with Claire Danes, excuse me, both with Claire Danes and, uh, and, and my date. Oh, it's that, we are roughly the same age and that movie was a, a huge just for our generation, wasn't it? Hmm. It's just a spectacular film. I I ended up in London because of that film. I, I was, it was out at the cinema and I saw a couple uh, by uh, the Statue of Eros in Piccadilly dressed as Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio from that movie. And I was I think I was about seventeen. I was like, I am moving to this city because wow. people do that here, and yeah. that's just a regular thing. I, all right. Um, did the date go well? It was a good movie, good mem good fond in that respect, or was it very just fond. the movie that made very, it the fondest? Very fond. Yeah. It was okay. very it was uh, very young. Right. It was very I mean, I must have been about fourteen or so or thirty. I mean, it was so sweet and it's just such a like lovely, pure memory of like being mesmerized by this film. I think we were holding hands by the end. It's just lovely. All right. Um because I somehow made Disney animation weird, uh Romeo and Juliet is the poster I'm putting up. How about that? That's the poster we're going to put up for that. Right. The next poster as we continue That's down the corridor. That's just you nixing animation for some weird <laughs> childhood, re childhood reason that we're not going to get into now on this show. But but you can make an appointment with my secretary and we'll, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... It's trouble. No, it's not troubling. It's not uh, family show. Family show. Right. The second poster I'm going to put up depicts your worst movie memory. My my worst movie memory was um, back in the days where, again, I'm just Steve Buscemiing myself here. But back in the days where on planes they only showed one film, and it started oh, when it God, started yeah. and it finished when it finished, and that was that was your choice. And there was a film I remember, and it's actually a wonderful memory, really, because I was with my dad and, again, very young, probably around that same age of young teens. We watched a film on a plane called Basil that, was, that starred, I think it was Christian Slater or somebody that I liked from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And... It was the only movie playing, and it was just we we, we both recognised about ten minutes in that this was maybe the worst film ever made, and we were just <laughs> giggling. We were giggling the whole time. So it's actually a lovely memory, but it was. It's, 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 uh, and I haven't gone back to revisit it because I'm so worried it'll be better than I remember. Um, because in my well, head, it's confirm, very important uh, that this film Basil is atrocious. I think I think I think it famously is. I think it's a film that uh, that uh, it never made it into cinemas. I think it was taken away from the, it's got one of these troubled histories, um, as some movies do, where it was taken away from the director and then recut by the f finances but of the film, which is always. But then certainly don't screen it in a place where people are physically <laughs> incapable of getting away and have nothing else to look at. <laughs> That's not kind. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Basil, uh, the Christian Slater, Jared uh, Leto uh, movie. Jared Leto's in Is it. Is he? As well. He must be a mm. child in it or something, probably. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I think he's he's, he's pretty young. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, I did uh, I, I I did look up Basil, and uh, yeah, I, it, it's a poster that I'm happy to put up as your worst, although slightly not worst movie memory because no, it's a lovely it sounds qu qu quite funny. Right then, the third poster. Yes. The last performance, Ben, that brought you to tears. Um. So I think the la the the last thing that made me feel teary was um. Uh, I just watched um, 
Zach Braff's movie, A Good Person, with Florence Pugh and Morgan Freeman. Mm. And they're both just so... Um, vulnerable in it and and cracked and and um kind of kind of raw and it was just it was just lovely to see morgan freeman doing something so like sensitive like that i've always been such a huge fan of his since shawshank obviously um and he's obviously just a, a legend but um and also florence Pugh's just i think she's just mesmerizing um no matter what she's playing, and yeah, there was some, there was just something that really, really got under my skin with it. Um, so that was okay. the last one. My my the one that made me the film that made me cry the most though is a slightly surprising mm -hmm. one, which I've I've talked about before. I think on a might have been on a another interview about movies, but but. Um, I I I'm quite a big believer in you know like film um, age guidelines. I think in America, you know, you have rated R, PG thirteen, and all this. But like in England, when I was growing up, it was fifty. You had fifteen and eighteen. And I remember seeing a film when I was about twelve or eleven um, that was uh, Spartacus, and it was definitely a fifteen or eighteen or something. And I, I became a big proponent of, of not seeing films until you are the age that they tell you to see them because emotionally I was just incapable of processing the sort of cathartic nature of the ending where Spartacus is, 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 is tasked with, with dueling his best friend and the winner will be crucified and the other will be, you know, sword stabbed to death by their best friend, and then them each wanting to be the one that just lets the other that that, that kills them each wanted to be the one that kills to not put their best friend through being crucified. It was just my, my little brain and heart could not <laughs> digest this at all. Um, I just couldn't process it, and I remember I started crying, and I think about. Two full days later, I think I'd sort of cried out, but I remember it being just a, a really big deal. So while while you decided that you were you you suddenly were like absolutely ratings have a purpose. Was it not also? Is it not also one of those things that at that age you got to see something? Because I think sometimes when we watch films that were not really. Um, meant to see mm. those are the movies that make you like fall in love with cinema because even if it's fear or if you watch a horror too young I mean I watched Jaws too young or in this case like something like that powerfully emotional like did that not make you fall in love with cinema yeah it probably you're probably it probably made me it probably made me who I am I suppose on some level uh, uh so yeah mm. you're probably right I, I do believe in the power of films in that way um yeah so, so watch whatever you want um <laughs> no yeah if you've got kids let them watch whatever whatever because then they'll be emotional wrecks like me and then they'll they'll be really balanced balanced human beings when they grow up <sighs> all right because because um, I like both of those, I'm going to give you two posters. I'm going to put a good person, Zach Braff's movie starring Florence Pugh and Morgan Freeman, next to Spartacus by Stanley Kubrick okay. as well, um, which I only watched for the first time last week. And um, I'm now a little bit in love with what a beautiful man Tony Curtis is. Oh I don't think I've ever seen a man well, also, as some, gorgeous so, so as Tony film. Curtis, it, it also when I was growing up, Some Like It Hot, it does not probably feature in any of my answers but it is one of my favourite ever films. And there's a brilliant version on Broadway at the moment when they've changed a few things. It's just fantastic. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, one of my absolute favourite films. It's got, it's got, you know, live jazz and Marilyn Monroe. And it's just, it's just a great, great film. Um, and Tony Curtis is just brilliant in it. Yeah. What a, one of cinema's great... Great last lines as well. Nobody's perfect. Um, <laughs> right then. That's better. Our, our final poster. That was a good line read for that, that line. Yeah, it right, our guys, final though, poster. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I try. I try. I just assumed the first was a rehearsal. Was, he was, he only needs that, one, just, one, re- yeah, one rehearsal. Just rehearsal. Yeah, one rehearsal and one take. Uh, okay, like like Frank Sinatra. Uh, one. Well, that's what we're going to call him. What one take, Ben? Right. Yeah, one take, Ben. Okay, so the final poster depicts your unpopular movie opinion, Ben Barnes. Sister Act Two is a masterpiece. Wow. Uh, so this is Sister Act 2 uh, that has uh, 18, one eight percent on, on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, yeah, you're I've saying done, it's I've a, done, a, I've a, done at least two films which, which are much lower, um, <laughs> but I don't think they're masterpieces. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're, you're, you're basically saying Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, uh, which is probably a, a, oh, a, one of the greatest titles that, for a sequel. Back in the Habit. You've got, you've got a You've got wordplay in the title. Come on. So it's one of these rare occasions where a sequel is better than the original. Tell me why. Well, I don't know if everyone thinks that, but this is my unpopular opinion. I mean, the first one, I think, probably the more popular one. I bet that's higher than 18% on Rotten Tomatoes, the first one. I bet it is. It is. It I, is. Bet it's, yeah. I bet it's right up there in the 60s or something. Um, uh, I just... It just captured everything about what I was sort of into at the time, sort of Lauren Hill's voice um, and that kind of... Um, you, you, you know, underdog kind of group story. It fed into a lot of those films I watched when I was young about the, the sports team who got the new coach or whatever. Like it, but, but in this case, it was Whoopi Goldberg. And it was... Um, it just sort of feeds into that structure in a way which is really pleasing to me, but the music is just so vibrant and it just, I don't know, it just chimes with me in, 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 a, in a way that always made me smile so so big. And I, and I have watched it latterly and it, it, I, I stand by my opinion, it's magic. All right. I'm, uh, that's, a, that's a strong argument. Okay. Sister Act Two, back in the habit. Brilliant! <laughs> it makes is me happy going every up. time you say the full title. This is how I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right then. Time to enter the auditorium. Oh, we push open the doors. We haven't even started the now. Film there's yet. a queue of people. Oh yeah, yeah. We've got. We've only got a few things left to do. We've only. We just got to play a few little bits on the screen <laughs> just to warm up the crowd okay. in this auditorium. Who? So, we're going to first of all play the trailer. For the movie you are most looking forward to seeing at the cinema. Um, the movie I'm most looking forward to seeing. Um, I am excited to see. Um, well, actually, so I just I was just reading really yesterday. I didn't realize it had started shooting already, but um, the, the, the sequel to Gladiator. Hmm. Um, obviously Gladiator, just an epic piece of, of cinema that I, uh, am vaguely obsessed with. And so for there to be another one, uh, Paul Mescal's, I think is, is amazing from normal people and Ridley Scott. So, so definitely, uh, just because I think there's a, sometimes a shortage of those big, huge sweeping kind of magnificent things that aren't superhero films. And... So I think that's it's kind of like important that, and I, they're making, and then the Napoleon movie as well with I think it's working oh, yeah. Phoenix. So that, those like I, 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 those are the things I would get the most excited about at the cinema, big sweeping huge things. But um, um, also Barbie, also the Leonard Bernstein movie that Bradley Cooper, my friend, has, has directed. Um, I think will be probably brilliant. Um. Oppenheimer, Nolan, Christopher Nolan, do no wrong. So, yeah, there's lots of good stuff that I'm excited about. But maybe, yeah, maybe I would say this Gladiator sequel would be the thing that I would be like, if you said I could go and watch that tomorrow, I'd be really, I'd be excited about that. Okay, well, well, I've got in touch with uh, Ridley Scott and I've got some footage together where we've knocked up a trailer for it and it looks great. Thanks, Ridders. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, old riddles there. My brain's telling me he would, my, my spider senses are telling me he would hate that. But yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Riddles has given us a trailer for Gladiator Two. No, no. Back, back in the habit. Oh, it doesn't work. Yeah. No, uh, I like okay. It. Back in the back in the. <laughs> what are those? What were those little gladiators sort of leather skirts called? Uh, we need to find out. Uh, oh well, back back it back in loin. Back in the, I'm, uh, back in the loin cloth. Stop. Gladiator to do back in the loin cloth. Uh, yeah. What's a what's a what's a what's a phrase that involves line? Yeah, okay. Gladiator two. Stay in loin. Stay, stay in loin. Nope. No. No. no absolutely not. Uh, no. Terrible. Terrible business. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's. Uh, I think actually Gladiator two. Back in the habit is the best. Right. The next thing. We're going to play on the screen is the movie moment that makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air. Um, so I would say that um, it has been documented, and I can't possibly do a podcast with this like this without mentioning. I have a I have a line of um, original movie posters, actually, much like the one you're de- describing down my corridor in my home, <laughs> which has original movie theater posters of the movies that I connected to when I was younger. Um, things like the princess bride and karate kid, you know, original spot. This is final tap original That's... posters for the movies of things that I love. Um, oh, wow. And the sort of the, the pride of place, my prized possession is my original back to the future, uh, poster. Um, and I actually met That's... Michael. I met Michael J. Fox quite recently at, at a at a sort of fan convention, and um, I was b- b- practically speechless. Um, <laughs> I just think he's a, just a wonderful man and a wonderful actor, and um, always wanted to be more like him. Anyway, the the. Um, so I would say definitely something from Back to the Future. I would say it's difficult for me because I, I love the opening so much with the clocks going off. And then when he finally like kicks his skateboard, grabs the back of the car and that Huey Lewis in the news song kicks in. Oh. It's just absolute magic. And it makes me, but I, but I think that's a little bit cheaty because it, it makes me pump my fist. It makes me feel that way because I love it so much. So the moment in the film is probably where he punches Biff you know, where he knocks him out uh, in the car and you're kind of going, yes, you know, da, 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 da. It's, just, <laughs> it's just amazing in every way. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I love it. Biff getting punched out in Back to the Future. Okay, the next moment we're playing. What do you consider cinema's most shocking moment? Well, there were two moments that jumped to mind, and um, because this is my fantasy scenario, um, I'm allowed them both. Um, I, I decided, <laughs> um, uh, even though you Just are, you even though you are rules. lord and master and arbiter of all things, this podcast, I've still decided I'm allowed to. <laughs> well, you can pick. You can pick. Uh, I would say the two right. that I can think of are the end of Usual Suspects, um, where it is revealed who Kaiser Sose actually is, which I'm not even going to say who or what, because in case people haven't seen it, which I suspect a lot of people haven't, um, Mm -hmm. I would say that is a very shocking, um, sort of thrilling cinema moment, because it's a brilliant film. Um, But I think also um, Brad Pitt's Open the Box at the end of Seven. Oh! What's in the box? He's, what's in the what's box? In the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? He's so brilliant in that, and it's just an extra. You know, it obviously it's a, it, on the if we sort of one of my one of my um, more favourite sort of really dark films, but just the ending just leaves you chilled and um, hmm. and a broken yeah. blob on the floor. So yeah, I, yeah, let's go with that actually. It's certainly the movie for me where Brad Pitt went from being, you know, uh, like this person who I was aware of 
to an, a bona fide movie star. No, After I think seven, I was such, like, this... a, such a star, such a br- such an incredible, like an incredible actor. Hmm. Probably the one that I'm like, oh, that I think those are the best choice, like film career choices out of pretty much anyone. I just think he's, I think he's, he's played a blinder. <laughs> All right, and I don't think anyone, anyone can disagree with you that certainly one of cinema's most shocking moments is the end of Seven. What's in the box? Okay, what is the line or the piece of dialogue from a movie that most affected you? Um, Well, the first thing that jumped into my head was a a one-word line, which was, um, I think, the second last Harry Potter film where Alan Rickman, who is one of my absolute all time favorites, just, just says to Dumb- Dumbledore, he just says always. And there's just something that was just built, you know, something that had built up over six films or seven films. Um, that was just yeah. this secret that was just like, and I think that anyone who has ever loved anyone, it's particularly unrequitedly. Uh, I think it's just like an incredible moment from an incredible actor in one word. So, so powerful. But huh. if you're talking about the way, so emotionally maybe that, but if you're talking about like the thing that stayed with me the most, I had the absolute uh, privilege of a lifetime of doing a couple of scenes with Robin Williams in a film called The Big Wedding, which it was an incredibly low Rotten Tomatoes score because it is not very good. Um, but I did have the privilege of doing some scenes with him. Absolute, you know, obviously icon and, you know, possibly my favourite ever actor. Uh, I just think he's can do everything. He's astonishing. That's incredible. And... What, was, what was that like? What's it like working with someone who, like, <sighs> like? I mean, I, I mean, like Robin Williams specifically. I don't know what I'd do if I, I, I obviously, you know, I never had the chance to interview him. But like, what? Well, I, I, the, I, what... sadly, they, they, there was a, there was a uh, there was a scene which was myself, Amanda Seyfried, and 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 um, Robin Williams playing the, this priest who was going to marry us. And I remember doing the scene once and it was sort of a little stiff and then the director came and said, okay, right, you just do whatever you want now, say whatever you want, improv, whatever you're feeling, you do, you just, guys just go for it. And I came up with absolutely nothing good in the scene whatsoever. <laughs> but I did in that moment say, you're asking me to improvise with Robin Williams. I'm not a matador. <laughs> uh, which I thought was... You know, sadly, save my best <laughs> improv for something that was totally unrelated <laughs> to the film. But um, uh, it was, you know, he ge- he gave me a generous lot. I mean, you know, make it, there's there's nothing in this world quite like making Robin Williams giggle at something. It's just, you know, <laughs> um, that's fantastic. It's just he's magic, yeah, magic. Uh, <laughs> but his performance in Good Will Hunting, obviously. Um, uh, hugely revered performance uh but there's the moment on the bench where he talks about his late wife and and talks about um that he doesn't he's not it's not those sort of big moments he remembers he's he's those little moments where i think he talks about her farting in bed or something he says he's he's, 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 you'll remember these little stuff that's and that's the good he says that's the good stuff and i was like that speech that ends with that's the good stuff is just um yeah just yeah just yeah absolutely just absolutely everything i could ever want from cinema if you you know if you you know that 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 scene is just perfect oh, and just okay. like tells you something it... tells you something really true you know yeah it's it's it's, it's i mean it's, it's 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 an incredible moment because uh i mean he's i mean it was so. I think that was the first time I saw Robin Williams in a film that wasn't, you know, big Robin Williams. Like, you know, not that he's not big in that film, but he's big emotionally. Whereas I'd always seen him no, sort of that off. Film uh, you know, that he could do everything, and and again, mm. more evidence that everyone is everything. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're nearly there. We've only got one more thing to do before we pay, play the movie that you have chosen to screen for us, and that is to play through the Dolby Atmos speakers, Mm -hmm. the best 
use of music in a film? So, so again, um, because I'm uh, greedy, I thought of two things. But one, but I think I'm allowed them both because <laughs> because one of them is a piece of music that was a, sort of a, assigned, ascribed to a moment in a film, and one of them is written for the film itself. Um, oh, okay. So the found music, I think, in in Platoon, they use um, when he sort of dr drops to his knees and puts his arms up in the air, and it's so overwhelming in a way that try is trying to express emotions that most of us, thankfully, will never come anywhere near to having to feel the kind of like aftermath of the trauma of war. Um, but I think it can be much more readily expressed through music, um, which is obviously a massive, important part of my life, than it can through anything you could say or watch. So, uh, and they play this Barbara Ardagio for strings, which is... And it just, it just... I heard it at the Royal Albert Hall once as well, and I, I'm not a huge classical music person. I don't really know very much about it, but I do know that I can't listen to that piece of music without feeling like someone's shoved their hand into my chest and it's just sort of rummaging around in my organs. It's just amazing. So that's that. But best piece of music written for film, I'm a massive John Williams fan. And that I remember I got into this phase once of listening to this over and over and over again. And maybe it sounds a bit trite, but I just think that the theme for Superman is just honestly one of the best pieces of music ever written. And it just sounds so exactly like what it is. It's, it has a tension, <laughs> a powerful tension with it. And then, and then it has this like, this like pride to it. And it has, it has nobility. It has nobility to it because he's like this, it's like, like this regal. And it's just like soaring and it sounds like someone flying. And it's just, it's just, it's the piece of music I think it's written that sounds the most like what you, like, I can't conceive of a piece of music that sounds more like a character or a, or, a, or an idea than that. <laughs> uh, when, so when would you listen to it? Like when you, like, would you listen to it? Because, you know, I've heard that some, just any time. Like for real, just like any time. Like I like sometimes wake up in the morning and play it really loudly, just having a cup of coffee, standing in your pants in the middle of the living room. It doesn't like for real. Just just try it, and please try it <laughs> now if you're listening. Just stop listening to this right now. You don't need the last answer, and just play this theme from Super John Williams theme from Superman really loud. And you tell me it doesn't make you feel doesn't make you feel better than you feel right now <laughs> okay but so i was gonna say so you don't do you ever use it on set because i heard i heard that some actors have a tiny little transistor th radio thing in their ear and actually use music during their performance like they'll have I remember music I, was, I worked with diane keaton who is just amazing um in that same film that ron williams was in and she would listen to this kind of like i, I assume it was sort of salsa music like in these earphones that were all the you know, the hooked up kind. And she would sort of dance in this tangery, salsery kind of way before. And then literally as they shouted action, she would just take them out and throw them on the... But it was still playing. You still hear it. <laughs> in the headphones. Uh, and I just thought it was brilliant. I sometimes have music playlists for characters, but I don't usually have it on set with me. I don't like walk off and listen to music to feel a certain way. I, 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 for me, it's too, it's, it's, it distracts me. But for some people, it's really useful. Okay. Uh, John Williams score, Superman. Wonderful. All right. Do you know where we are? It's the moment. It's the big moment. It's time to announce to our excited audience in this packed auditorium, apart, apart from on the 10 chairs next to you, so that you can get out if you want to, the movie that you have picked out of all other films to screen for us tonight. What are we watching, Ben? Um, well, obviously an unanswerable, completely unanswerable question and could be any of the yep. films that I've mentioned so far. Uh -huh. um, but the one that just hasn't had a mention, the one that the other movie poster in my collection, uh, 
of which there are a few others, but um, I'm just a huge rom-com fan. I love, um, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for all those kind of Notting Hill type Richard Curtis, the feet, all those feels, but I think that the, in the Nora Ephron vibes, but the, the sort of Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan of it all, but my nut, but the top for me um, is, uh, is when Harry met Sally and it's just such sizzling dialogue. Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal are just so perfect in it. And it's just about something which I, which when I was younger, I was like, oh, will I, will I ever understand that? And now I'm the age that I am. I know that I do understand it. And um, just about how people relate to each other and men and women in particular, or, or people, people in, um, you know, with, with romantic uh, ideals and people with, you know, in, in, in uh, complicated situations of which almost all relationships are. Um, and it's just, but it's just so funny. It's so simple. Um, it's visually perfect. It has some iconic moments. And uh, I remember going, uh, you know, I've seen it countless times, but definitely, you know, a it, 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 probably the answer to your first question you asked me about my best cinema experience was was going in my first ever drive-in cinema uh, in America, seeing it in a drive-in, which I always thought was so great, like from Greece or whatever, like wow. the Harry Potter drive-in, eating a pizza, which is acceptable because it wasn't from a cinema. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I just, it's just, it doesn't matter how many times I watch it. I, it just like fills me up. And, uh, so that's what we're watching because I said so. Oh, I mean, Toy, that, that, I mean, obviously it's been discussed and analyzed and accepted as one of cinema's great moments, but that fake orgasm scene and, 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 and you'll know about this from all your experiences on TV shows and films. It's like, it's almost the perfect collaboration of Nora Ephron realizing that the movie was too centered on Harry. So they wanted to give Meg Ryan something to do. Then Nora Ephron goes, Oh, let's do fake orgasms. Meg Ryan then goes, well, why don't I just fake one? And then Billy Crystal comes up with the killer line. I'll have what she's, she's having, having for the end. I mean, I mean just, that's 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 it. That's collaboration perfect. in film. It's just it's collaboration, but it's just it's just and it's just perfect. Mm. So that is your greatest romantic comedy of all time, as well as being the movie you're screening for. Is would you say that's your favorite? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, I have a handful of favorite films, and and that is certainly one of them. But it just didn't get a mention in any of the other questions, so. I think um, uh, it's a very, very good shout. Mine is quite a m much more recent one. I, it, your friend, Bradley Cooper, I'm right in thinking you said it. You, you're friends with Bradley he Cooper. He was in a film you? that I did like, called The Words, yeah, which that's was directed right. yeah. by another friend of mine called Brian Klugman, who is actually in his Bernstein movie as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's a very, very, very sweet man. I think Silver Linings Playbook is oh, just mega. Like, just incredible. Just a stunning, yeah, yeah. That's um, it's the it's the rom com I've rewatched most. So. Yeah, it's fantastic. But... I've seen it many many times. I would, I, you know, Notting Hill is is also, uh, you know, I would say just of the pure rom coms. For some reason, it hmm. just speaks to me. It's pro that's probably the film I've seen the most. Uh, that and Shawshank hmm. Redemption, probably the films I've seen the most in my life. Um, but tonight. But... Tonight, 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 Sally. Tonight, when Harry met Sally, is the movie we've screened. And that's it, Ben. The curtains have closed. The guests are milling out, smiling and chatting and thanking you for taking them on an incredible night out at the movies. But before you go, it's time for this week's mystery question, uh -oh. which weirdly references an earlier answer that you gave because we call this section, What's in the Box? What's oh, in the Box? What is in the Box? <laughs> Okay, so your mystery question. Oh, are you if rummaging in a box to pull out a question? Is that what's, what's happening? Yeah, yeah, I've got a little question here. I don't get to see it beforehand. It's handed to me. Okay, by, is, this a, uh, is this a phone in question? Or... This is a question that you are about to. Okay, it's quite an easy one this time. Okay, great. Well, I don't know. It might not be easy. You've previously starred 
in The Punisher. Would you yeah. ever consider returning to a comic book movie slash movie universe? And if so, what character would you want to play? Yeah, that's a good that's a good uh, question, which I do get asked quite often, actually. Um, would I want to play oh, okay. Jigsaw again? Uh, which I, I, I loved playing that character, so I definitely would. But um, look, I think every... Every kid who grows up wants to be, be an actor, you know, I think on some level thinks about what superhero would I want to be. Um, and again, I've talked about this before, but I, I, I have a, a picture of myself when I'm about three in a Batman outfit that I've made, which is just a yellow piece of paper with string. Like I've hole punched the corners of the of the yellow piece of paper and tied a bit of string and I'd drawn a very um, um, I would say a, a rough outline of a bat um, in a black crayon um, <laughs> and it's a very sweet sweet picture but I think yeah so I, I mean I think Batman was always the one for me um, but with the Superman theme tune, preferably. <laughs> okay, Batman. Because I'm but allowed, with the original, because it's my fancy, and I'm allowed to. Um, yeah. But yes, I mean, you've I, you've, you've, yeah, you've, you've, you've you've decided on Batman, then, I yeah, I can see you. I think you'd make a good Batman, actually. I think that'd be great. I'd love to see as Batman. I would. I think. I, um, I, th I think I would enjoy the Bruce Wayne of it all as well. Um, I think that a lot of superheroes, I, 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 I'm interested in the superhero, but I don't know how good a fit I would be for the alter ego. I don't think I'd be, a, you know, obviously an ancient, but I don't think I ever would have been a good, particularly good Peter Parker or... Um, I think I would be a reasonable Clark Kent. I don't think I'd be a very... I don't think I would play be a convincing Superman at all. Um, <laughs> but there are other, there are other interesting um, characters, sort of Gambit, has never really been done. Um, oh my god, it, you'd be a good gambit. Way. I'd love he's, he's like he's fun. I could bring some of that Logan from Westworld fun to that character. Mm. Um, there, yeah, there, there, there are there are many, and, and obviously I will say yes to any any and all. But um, uh, who doesn't <laughs> want to be a superhero? <laughs> uh, thank you for answering our mystery question. You're welcome. And Ben, that is it. Your taxi has arrived to ferry you back to reality. But before you leave, let's recap your perfect night out at the cinema. You are going with a date at 10 p.m. at night. You are sitting halfway up in the middle, but you're booking out the 10 seats next year in case you need to leave at some point. Because as we will see throughout these answers, you have reversioned the perfect night at the cinema and removed my position as Lord and Master of this <laughs> cinema. You are having a medium-sized salted popcorn. You're chucking some M&Ms in. You're having a Diet Coke, and that is it. We're not having any warm foyer cinema food. We're putting up some posters now. Your fondest movie memory is your date for Romeo and Juliet when you were 14. I, I've, I've put up a Lion King poster as well, but I'm not looking at it because it brings back memories um, that I haven't had. It brings back no memories because that's the problem. <laughs> Next, we're putting up a poster for your worst movie memory, which is watching the 1998 barely seen period drama Basil on a plane. The 1998? Next so up. I was about 17. Mm -hmm. I thought I was about 10. <laughs> no. Wow. No, <laughs> All right, well that's wrong. I've reinvented my life. <laughs> Carry on. And the third poster we're putting up depicts the last performance that brought you to tears, which was a good person, but the poster I'm really putting up is Spartacus yep. because you saw it when you were too young and it broke you. Yep. Your unpopular movie opinion poster is Sister Act 2. Wait for it. Back, Back in, the in the habits. We we'll then played the trailer for. Uh, well, we got in touch with Ridders, and he put together <laughs> a trailer for Gladiator Two. Uh, all the moment that makes you pump your fist in the air. We're playing is when Biff gets punched out in Back to the Future. Cinema's most shocking moment is the end of Seven. The line or piece of dialogue from a movie that most affected you always from Alan Rickman in Harry Potter or Robin Williams 
monologue on the bench in Goodwill That's Hunting. The, good stuff. the best. That's the good stuff. The best the piece stuff. of you, muse of music in a movie. It could be Sergeant Elias's death, Willem Dafoe in a platoon. But really, it sounds like the Superman theme by John Williams. Because you should you should just stop listening to this podcast right now and play it. <laughs> and finally. To end our night, we are screening one of cinema's greatest ever romantic comedies, When Harry Met Sally, and that really is it. Ben, thank you so much You're for so taking welcome. us on this trip to the movies. Have you had a good time? I've had a brilliant time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. <laughs>